long beach green business association is designed to help both new and existing businesses in long beach and surrounding areas to fully utilize all the cost saving benefits of going green meredith gosseland is ceo and meredith nice to see you oh my pleasure thanks for inviting me so tell us about the association i really feel like um, cities green cultures come from the bottom up mm -hmm. that business drives culture in the united states and um, i felt that that was missing in long beach that we really needed to have a, a business culture building so let's talk about the structure of the association and how the activities are funded well actually it's a membership organization much like a chamber mm -hmm. so it's funded by memberships it's funded by um, certifications it is funded by workshops and other services that we provide for our members so who are your members and how do you assist them our members run the gamut from home-based businesses mm -hmm. all the way up to the Lakewood Chamber of Commerce mm -hmm. <laughs> um, and kind of everything in between um, we do not have a lot of large corporations. For the most part, they can have their own um, green business uh, segment within their corporation, so they don't really need us as much. Um, but I also like working with smaller businesses because they can change more rapidly. Meredith, tell us about the benefits of obtaining green business certification. Well, getting green certification tells the consumer or tells your clients that a third party has taken, a, taken your business under the microscope and has looked carefully at what you're actually doing. People are very skeptical when a company calls themselves green. So that certification helps to um, give you credence or uh, validation. The certifications that we do are holistic. Mm -hmm. um, they're in depth so that um, pretty much the if you've passed our certification, you are at the same level or have exceeded other certifications. The only exception would be those businesses that are governed by EPA and ISO regulations. We don't do certification in those areas, um, but we will refer a business or help them to meet the standards of ISO and uh, EPA. And what about other important activities? Our primary one is to develop a buy local program for Long Beach, uh, helping us to keep a healthy economy and to develop the economy here in Long Beach. Um, if uh, purchases are made within Long Beach, then we're retaining not only the tax money, but the profits as well. If somebody wants to find out more about the association, how do they do that? Well, they can call us at 562-343-8697, or they can go on the web, um, www.lbgba.org. Meredith, thank you very much. Thank you. Established in 1996, Cambrian Home Care was originally formed as a home care company offering non-medical options for maintaining the young and older person independently at home. Now Cambrian has diversified to meet community needs. Paul Curose is Director of Operations. And Paul, nice to see you. Nice to see you. Paul, tell us about your care services for the developmentally disabled. We care for children and adults with developmental disabilities in their homes. We provide services of personal care, socialization, assisting them with whatever it is that they need to offer families relief so that they can get out of the home and do whatever it is that they need to do. What about your home care services? What specifically are they? For home care services, we provide non-medical services. Um, we care for seniors, HIV clients. We perform a wide array of services from homemaking to personal care, bathing, grooming, transferring, meal prep. Cambrian also provides staffing services for hospitals and physicians. What's involved here? Well, what we try to do is offer relief for doctor's offices by hiring on a temporary basis when they might have someone out either on maternity leave or they just have a large influx and they just need additional services. Paul, tell us about the qualifications 
and the experience of your staff and the training they receive. Well, our field staff, what we do is an extensive background check, references, and skills evaluation on them prior to actually coming on board with us. We actually have an on-site training program where they go through for approximately a week uh, prior to actually seeing their first client. So, Paul, how does Cambrian attract and keep the best people? Well, one I would say is because of our in-office staff. We try to make sure that we um, make them feel at home, at ease, and show them that we value them as individuals. And two, we have a strict hiring criteria so that we make sure that we hire the best. If somebody wants to find out more about Cambrian, how do they do that? They can call us at our toll-free number, 877-390-4300. It's monitored 24 hours a day, seven days a week with a live customer service person. Or they can contact us on our website at www.cambrianhomecare.com. Si gustan estar hablando en español, por favor, también se puede comunicar con nosotros, 877-390-4300. Paul, thank you very much. Thank you. The Default News reports on trends and issues within the housing foreclosure industry. It helps homeowners, investors and real estate executives better understand the foreclosure process. Anne-Marie Dulabond is CEO of The Default News. Anne-Marie, nice to see you again. Great to see you too, Mike. And our topic this week is buying foreclosed or real estate owned properties. Firstly, how does the buying process work? Well, the buying process works in a couple of different ways depending on which type of a property you're buying. But since the, the answer could be at least 20 minutes long, let's just focus on buying an REO property, which means buying property that's directly owned by the bank. The investor really should focus on what they want to buy. Um, before they talk to a, a real estate agent, they should know if they want to buy, let's say, a, a condo or a single family resident or a multiplex. They should know if they want it to be an investment property or they want cash flow or they want to live in it or are they just going to rent it out. Once they have the really solid foundation of what they're looking for, then they'll want to go and find a reputable REO listing agent. And from there, that agent can better define and find the right property for them. So what are some of the things then to be aware of when buying foreclosed properties? There's a lot of things to be aware of and again it depends on the stage the property is in. For example, if you're buying a property that is directly from the homeowner and let's say it's a short sale, you have to really pre-qualify the homeowner first. Make sure that they qualify for a short sale because you can invest easily three, four, five months of time and energy into trying to buy one property only to find out at the very end that the homeowner doesn't qualify for it. If it's a property that is owned by the bank, really the property is um, going to be sold as is. So you have to consider, are you ready for all of the repairs? So you might want to go out and get two or three different bids to find out if you have the finances to be able to pay for those repairs. Things like this. Just do as much due diligence as you can in regards to pre-qualifying the property, the homeowner, and making sure that you're qualified to make that investment. Are buyers taking on any additional liabilities? Some of them are. Some of them are, and that's because they're not doing their due diligence. For example, let's say a, an investor wants to buy a property at an auction. I know a number of people who have done very well at buying properties at auctions, but they, they see the property, it looks good, maybe they haven't looked inside, maybe they don't realize that there's a tenant living there. They go to the auction, they make the bid, they win the bid, and this is a property that they might want to buy to live in. Well, after they buy the property, they find out there's someone living there, well, they have to evict the person, and that could take a couple of months. And So these are liabilities that they have to make sure that they're doing their due diligence to to avoid. Is it true that banks are selling their real estate owned properties at 30% below market value? Many people think that that the banks are selling them at way below market value because there's such an inundated, uh, the market is so inundated with properties, but that's not true. The banks are trying to sell the property at their market value. It all just depends on how long the property has been on market. So they're going to be more willing, they meaning the banks, are going to be more willing to negotiate their price the longer the market, the property has been on the market. So 
if the property's been on the market, let's say 90 days, 120 days, more than likely they'll come down below the market value. If somebody wants to find out more, how do they do that? They can get a hold of me at my website, which is www.thedefaultnews.com. And Marie, thank you very much. Thanks, Mike. The Arts Council for Long Beach helps to manage the Percent for Art program for the city of Long Beach. The goal of the Public Art and Design Department is the revitalization of neighborhoods through public art. Leslie Markle is Director of Public Art and Design for the Arts Council. And Leslie, nice to see you. Nice to see you, Mike. How has the Arts Council been involved in public art for the city of Long Beach? Well, the Arts Council's had a long history with public art. That goes back to 1989. And uh, we, in partnership with the Long Beach Redevelopment Agency, we partner to manage the Percent for Arts uh, program. The Long Beach Redevelopment Agency is, uh, has a policy, that's a Percent for Art policy, where uh, development money um, in redevelopment zones actually goes to fund public art. This year, we're actually doing uh, $900,000 worth of projects in the city, uh, citywide in all of the redevelopment zones. So tell us about public art here and how it's supported. It's supported, as I said, by the Long Beach Redevelopment Agency. Um, we're really fortunate to have a percent for art policy. That's one of the main ways that art actually gets funded uh, in the city. And so it's a, it's a primary mechanism for funding the arts. Um, the Redevelopment Agency is currently working on the Promenade Project where we have uh, $1.1 million going to um, public art for the Promenade and that's in addition to the $900,000 that they're funding for uh, permanent projects and temporary projects this year. Leslie, has public art revitalized the Long Beach neighborhoods? Well, it definitely is within the mission of the Redevelopment Agency in trying to re revitalize community neighborhoods. Uh, but it's also a quality of life issue. It's really, we try to weave the, the uh, art into the fabric of the city and so that it's really an integrated part of the urban landscape. Um, so uh, all of those quality of life things, I think, also can potentially promote uh, cultural tourism. So what are some examples? Well, historically, I think some great examples are on Ocean Boulevard. If you drive down there, uh, Ned Smythe's Dream of Simultaneous Connections, which is a large sculpture on uh, Ocean Boulevard. And actually, just behind us here is a good example of uh, a work by Patrick Moore. Um, Patrick has done uh, several projects in Long Beach. Um, he has a project in, in uh, the Long Beach Airport. Um, and so really, it's all around the city if you, if you go and, and look for it. And what about new projects? We actually have a lot of projects planned for this year uh, to actually be completed this year. We have eight permanent projects for uh, citywide redevelopment areas. We have a lot of great artists. We did a national call and uh, we got artists and artist teams commissioned. Uh, they're all under contract. They're doing design development and, and moving forward. We, we expect to actually see some of them installed as early as March. Okay, if somebody wants to find out more then, how do they do that? The address of the website is artslb.org, A-R-T-S-L-B.org, and you can find out more about public art there. There's a public art uh, web page that actually has examples of previous projects that have been completed. Leslie, thank you very much. Thank you, Mike. Cambrian is a company no medical de cuidado en casa desde 1996 con oficinas a través del sur de California que proporcionan los servicios a domicilio para asistencia en bañar, cuidado personal, limpieza en casa y preparación de comida para ancianos, personas con deficiencias mentales y cuidado después de cirugía. Nuestros trabajadores son nuestros empleados. En caso de herida, el seguro del propietario no es responsable y ninguna necesidad de preocuparse por impuestos de paga de los empleados. Nos encargamos de todo. Tenemos un porcentaje alto de empleados que hablan español. Nuestros trabajadores son locales y completaron un programa de capacitación muy extraordinario. Nuestras experiencias y la dedicación nos hacen la elección correcta. Llámenos a cualquier hora, 877-390-4300. Ed 
Edward Vlase is on the board of directors for the Regional Hispanic Chamber of Commerce. And is Chief Operating Officer and General Manager of the Petroleum Club of Long Beach. And Edward, nice to see you. Thank you, Mike. It's a pleasure being here with you. You're on the board and you're involved with the hospitality industry. Are things picking up with the local economy? You know, Mike, if you were to ask me that, uh, I would say uh, about a month and a half ago or so, uh, the answer would have been no. Uh, but I see a slight increase uh, in business, and, uh, and that's a great thing for us. So what's the situation then with the hospitality sector? The hospitality business has, as I believe, been hit hard uh, due to the economy and the crisis and so forth. Uh, but I, uh, I do believe that uh, people still will go out and uh, have events and weddings and sweet 16s uh, and birthday parties and so forth. People will still go out and have dinner. Uh, so the hospitality business, I think, will, will conquer. Uh, but uh, but I, do, I do see it getting a little bit better. Are these businesses then capitalizing on new and effective marketing initiatives? I think they are. I, I, I think people... Uh, are getting uh, smarter and smarter and, and, uh, and marketing their product uh, continuously and, and consistency, uh, consistently, I'm sorry. And uh, so I, I do think that they are capitali capitalizing on their, on their uh, segments. So what are your five best marketing tips for businesses in the current economic climate? I think what's important, Mike, is uh, the internet. The internet is very, very important. Um, also, ethnic advertising uh, in the Spanish market is very, very important. I think um, marketing yourselves to the local businesses uh, is also very, very, very important uh, for your success. I also think that uh, getting involved with the community, having in-house events uh, is very, very important for your marketing as well. And if somebody wants to find out more about the Chamber, how do they do that? They could go to uh, the regional Hispanic chamber and I'll uh, be more than happy to take care of them. Edward, thank you very much. Thank you very much, Mike, for having us. Cambrian is a non-medical home care company since 1996 with offices throughout Southern California providing in-home services such as bathing, grooming, light housekeeping, and meal preparation for seniors, developmentally disabled, and post-surgery. Our caregivers are our employees. In the event of injury, the homeowner's insurance is not liable and no need to worry about payroll taxes. We take care of all of it. We work with many cultures and have a high percentage of Spanish speakers. Our caregivers are local and have completed a very unique training program. Our experience and dedication makes us the right choice. Call us 877-390-4300 anytime. Long Beach City Council recently approved a small business recruitment pilot program introduced by Mayor Bob Foster. Bob Foster is a staunch campaigner for the Long Beach economy and small business. And Bob, great to see you. It's my pleasure, Mike. So how tough is it at the moment for small business? Well, it's tough for business all over, but in small business is the engine of growth in the, in the economy. 70% uh, of the jobs created in the last decade have been small business. So, you know, when credit gets tight, small business struggles so we're going to try to find a way to help them out uh, and see if we can uh, make sure that they thrive in the city of Long Beach and around the city of Long Beach. Tell us about the pilot program and why is it so important? Well what we started uh, in the city of Long Beach is a small business development pilot program. Uh, we've seen it work in other places and what we're trying to do is get a database of small businesses collected it together so that when we put contracts out we can tell those who are bidding on those contracts general contractors or others that there are small businesses available to bid on these and we'll have a goal of twenty percent 
of contracting with small business so you see this mostly on big construction projects if you tell a contractor that they need to at least check with small business and we're going to have a goal of twenty percent they'll very likely turn to them and include them in their bid the problem today is we don't know where they are who they are so we're going to create a registry we we'll have a registry of small contractors, both in the city of Long Beach and outside, and that will be available now as a resource to those bidding on projects in the city and around the city. Is the 20 percent of city contracts in three departments a goal or a hard target? It is a goal. We're starting with those three departments because we want a manageable process to and fully evaluate it at the end. And we don't want to hire any additional staff. Those three departments do a lot of contracting and they indicated they can do this with existing staff. We think we'll get to the goal or maybe even beyond the goal. So what percentage of city contracts have small business made up in the past? You know, we really don't know. Uh, one of the problems of not having a registry of small business, we have very poor data on who exactly we're contracting with and what size they are. This will be able to get us that information. So hopefully a year or two from now, I can answer that question <laughs> with some accuracy. So what type of small businesses are going to be most advantaged? You know, I think it's, it, it'll be almost anything. Uh, as I mentioned before, a lot of it will be in the con construction area. But the, the port, for example, our Port of Long Beach has had a program like this, which has just been evaluated, proved very successful. They've indicated they've saved money on it. And you've got things like caterers, locksmith, landscapers, uh, all kinds of things that can be contracted with small business. What we're going to do is have three categories. We're going to have small business, Long Beach small business, and very small business, and try to have business in each one of those categories. We're obviously trying to help businesses in our city, but we also want to help small business generally in Southern California. And Bob, how will the program then be monitored during the pilot year? We'll have uh, staff evaluating the results at the, end of the, uh, at the end of the year. We'll see how successful we are, how close to the goal we are, whether or not we've actually saved money or it's cost us more money. I think experience will indicate that it will save money. What, what's happened in other places is you wind up getting an increase in competition. And you know the theory, you get more competition, you tend to get lower prices. If somebody wants to find out more about this, Bob, how do they do that? I would urge them to call uh, the mayor's office. Uh, it's the mayor of Long Beach, Bob Foster, at 562-570-6801. And you'll get all the information you need. We'd love to have people call so we can get them registered. Mayor Bob Foster, thank you very much. Mike, it's been a pleasure being with you. Thanks very much. It's a good program. The Museum of Latin American Art, founded by Dr. Robert Gumbiner, is the only museum in the Western United States that exclusively features contemporary Latin American art. Located in the newly developing East Village Arts District of Long Beach, the museum has an extensive program of exhibitions and activities and boasts elegant venues for corporate and special events. Martha Guzman is Public Relations and Marketing Manager. Great to see you. Nice to meet you. What a beautiful gallery. Thank you. Tell us about the history and the vision of the founder, Robert Gumbiner. Robert Gumbiner was a physician, and after he retired from medical practice, he'd been collecting art for a very long time since he was in medical school, and he'd accumulated so much art that there was really no more place than his home to store it, and he felt that a great place to do that would be a museum and he'd actually owned this property as part of the FHP group which was a health uh, organization one of the very first HMOs and um, he had the space and so that's where he began the museum he chose this place so what's the significance of the museum to American and Latin American culture well, the mission and Dr. Gumbiner's vision for the institution was to expose the American public who might not otherwise know uh, Latin American artists who've lived and worked there since 1945 onward and just expose them to the variety of art that's there. Um, you know, a lot of people know famous names like Fernando Botero and a variety of others, but oftentimes they don't realize that there's so much art being created. They just don't realize that there's so many emerging 
artists as well as very established ones there. So that was part of the mission and that's actually the mission of the museum to expose people to those artists that may, they may not otherwise know about. So what does the museum bring to Long Beach and its residents? Latin American culture at its best uh, because aside from exposing people to those artists that they may not know about, we also hold a variety of art workshops, uh, films, festivals, there's always something going on here. Um, every Sunday is free to the public. Target sponsors those Sundays and we have a ton of art workshops for the entire family and the income they encapsulate the art that's already here and they ba they're based on some of the art that's currently on exhibit and we have music from those countries as well. Um, there's just a ton of to do here. Martha, tell us about the current exhibitions and special events. Well, currently we have two exhibitions, Arnaldo Roche, Hermandad, Brotherhood. He's a Puerto Rican artist, prominent post-expressionist artist from Puerto Rico, who's been in the art scene for quite some time, and so we're very proud to have this exhibition here. We also have uh, an exhibition by an Argentinian artist, Claudio Gallina, and his exhibition is titled Memory and Oblivion, and it's a fantastic exhibition. What it does, it's, it brings people back to those early childhood years and so there's even an installation that recreates a classroom and so there's just a lot going on. We also have lectures. We'll be having a lecture uh, dealing with the art of Arnaldo Roche in the coming months. Uh, currently we also have some art workshops that are based on some of the art that's currently on view both from our permanent collection and our temporary exhibitions. And what other facilities are available here? We have a sculpture garden which is available for private events. We also hold a lot of our own uh, events from the museum there, both festivals, concerts, our gala. We have a gala coming up this April that will be held at the sculpture garden. We have the Balboa room, which is a multifunctional room that people can rent out for private parties. Um, again, a lot of our events also take place in that area. And our lobby, which is available for private uh, parties as well. So how is the museum supported? It's supported through corporate and individual donors. Uh, we also have the Robert Gumbiner Foundation, which is one of our biggest donors. Um, individuals, people, just the public, and government grants. If somebody wants to find out more, Martha, how do they do that? They can visit our website, www.mola.org. Martha, thank you very much. Thank you. Cambrian is a non-medical home care company since 1996 with offices throughout Southern California providing in-home services such as bathing, grooming, light housekeeping and meal preparation for seniors, developmentally disabled and post-surgery. Our caregivers are our employees. In the event of injury, the homeowner's insurance is not liable and no need to worry about payroll taxes. We take care of all of it. We work with many cultures and have a high percentage of Spanish speakers. Our caregivers are local and have completed a very unique training program. Our experience and dedication makes us the right choice. Call us 877 390-4300 anytime.